camera off now, though we always appreciate seeing all of your faces. Um, if you want to ask a question, feel free to send it into the chat at any time. We'll remember it for later for the Q&A um, or just write it down, ask it during the Q&A. Um, so tonight we have the fourth and last lecture of our SIPANA lecture series on soft power. Um, the three other cities of Amsterdam, Sibleiden and Sibitra have already hosted theirs and we are very happy to host the last one today. Um, Today, we are joined by Dr. Peter Bloom. Uh, he is a professor of management at the University of Essex and his research focuses on the radical possibilities of technology for redefining and transforming contemporary work in society. Um, <laughs> uh, he's written or co-written quite some books uh, which include authoritarian capitalism in the age of globalization, as well as the ethics of neoliberalism, the business of making capitalism moral. Um, but tonight he's here to talk to us about um, the corporate hegemony um, in times of crisis, specifically, I think, about uh, the US and American uh, cultural hegemony. Um, he will discuss how US colonialism has been extended through uh, the way of the American exceptionalism that's been portrayed through American media and how this has changed or been excelled due to um, forces such as corporate globalization, climate change, or militarism. Um, and with that, I would just like to give the word to Dr. Peter Bloom. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, that was a very, very uh, kind introduction. Okay, can everyone see the screen? All right, right on. So. Thank you very much. I mean, just to give a bit of background uh, to that very kind of introduction. So uh, my work uh, looks primarily uh, at three very particular things. One, the relationship between economic marketization and political authoritarianism. Two, um, and I think this is where uh, this will look at, uh, this presentation will look at a bit more. Um, the uses of different discourses in order to promote various types of hegemony, uh, both globally um, and societally, um, and at work, um, and when kind of within the public imagination. And three, uh, the way in which technology can be used to promote more democratic and egalitarian forms of economic association and development. Um, so today, though, I'm going to very I'm going to be looking specifically at uh, questions. Uh, how has, in many ways, popular culture shifted in the wake of a variety of crises that I think have challenged neoliberalism? Now, I should say that there's a lot of ways in which you can look at this, right? I mean, there, in, in, and I know this series is on soft power. So there's an incredible amount of ways in which you can look at this. You can look at this through the medium itself, such as film or book, and you can look at the ways in which they've spread um, and the way in which this knowledge spreads on a very material level. You can look at this from actually what they're trying to say and who they're trying to say it to. I try to look at this as though shifting sets of discourses for justifying various forms of power relations. And I wanna look at two, uh, if you will, pieces of art today, both of which are from the United States and which I don't think most people would really uh, immediately think of as something critically promoting capitalism on the one hand, global capitalism on the other, and then more broadly, the, you know, an idea of American exceptionalism, okay? And I think this is really important because I think it's very easy to look at things like Hollywood movies and uh, Marvel films, and even if you enjoy them, be able to point to, you know, really serious ways in which they promote kind of standard, often dominant values. I think it's much more difficult, but much more important to look at the more subtle ways in which art is spreading particular types of discourses that may not be immediately obvious, right? Um, so if everyone is still with me and no one is asleep yet, uh, we can get right to it, okay? So kind of the title of my paper really is Resilient Power, Corporate Hegemony and Crisis. And what I want to look at is the following. 
So I want to show that traditional soft power in films and book is in crisis, okay? And it's in crisis because actually neoliberalism's in crisis, okay? Traditional forms of, uh, I would say, European and US empire is in crisis. Capitalism is in crisis. So in many ways, this demands a different type of justification and legitimization, right? I think today, especially for uh, many young people, right, and I don't, I don't want to generalize too much, so if, if I'm wrong, just uh, throw tomatoes at me digitally and put it in the chat, right? But I think if, if, you, if you gave just a very blatant kind of like rah, rah, go America, right, or a very optimistic sense of how things are going, right, I think there would be a lot of challenges to that and a lot of skepticism, right? Um, I think that you know, we are in the midst of, in the 21st century, you know, two major profound crises, one economic, one ecological, uh, sorry, one public health, and then one more existential ecological crisis. Also, I think that it's very obvious that traditional assumptions of what works, right, such as is often associated with the free market, um, even for those who would usually promote this quite blindly, realize it simply doesn't have the resources and answers to solve the problems that it inflict upon us. Um, I thought in many ways, COVID-19 was a very interesting example of something in terms of decolonization. In the sense that on the one hand, it was very apparent, and, and, and this is, I won't talk about it much because uh, it's not the, the topic of the presentation, but as someone who studied technology, there's still this kind of very Eurocentric idea that somehow Europe and the United States are at the cutting edge of technology. And they're simply not, certainly when it comes to things like public health, which you saw very much in the first and second waves of the COVID-19 crisis. But also more broadly, I mean, at this point, I think it's very obvious that uh, the US and Europe have been a hindrance to you know, the public spread of the vaccine globally. Um, so this is all a sense in which traditional ways of promoting soft power um, in a kind of triumphant sense have, you know, they're largely not as relevant anymore. And, and they're simply not as, as uh, I mean, if anything, I think people would associate them quite cynically as being so far distant from reality um, that there was very little that they offered, um, even, in, even as a point of fiction. Um, so what I want to argue is that actually, Soft power, uh, particularly is linked to kind of, of uh, global corporations, um, has shifted from values of triumph to resilience, right? So it's gone from a discourse of kind of very optimistic and progress to one of how do we cope? How do we persevere? And using a kind of play on words, I think you can say that uh, it's been preserving itself in the midst of these crises through a discourse of persevering, right? And so there has been this move from values of triumph to resilience. And that's a key part that we're gonna be looking at here. The ways in which this notion of being able to actually challenge corporate hegemony, okay? This ability of art, right? to be more than something that just spreads an imperial discourse, okay? More than just justifies dominant values. Um, it's really hindered because it's embraced this idea of resilience, okay? And what becomes important here is that it shifts the discussion from an existential one politically um, of, do we want this system or not? What would be alternative systems? What could be a different way of doing things? To look at the heroic way in which people are able to be resilient, are able to cope. I want to look um, at two very particular forms of this. Um, one is liberal realism, as I call it, and that's the need to pragmatically accept the status quo. And it's a little bit of a way in which you begin to start saying that Anything that is against uh, this, right, that isn't quote unquote pragmatic, that isn't willing to say, well, the best we can do are small reforms, becomes something that is very easily and quickly dismissed as idealistic, right? And there becomes this not just defensive attitude, 
but also an incredibly kind of strong reactionary discourse of, you know, what is at stake is just, you know, making the best of things. And why I feel like this is a discourse of resilience is because as we'll see in our kind of exemplar case, our paradigm case, um, which is uh, the former President Obama's new book, it becomes almost like a, a very heroic move, right? Like he was willing to make the hard choices. He was willing to, um, you know, do what needed to be done in order to, you know, make the small changes against the political system that is very clear in his memoirs. He realizes soon is 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 quite, in his view, intractable, unchangeable, and corrupt. The other is what I call a resilient neoliberalism. Um, and, and by the way, I mean, I, I haven't been to these other parts, so if, if I'm using words or if uh, things like that, um, many of you aren't familiar with, just you know, say it in the chat, let me know and uh, I can explain them more, okay? Um, so if this is too much jargon, uh, like the point is not to sound intelligent, the point is to actually start a conversation, right? So please feel free if you're saying, oh, I don't know particularly what you're talking about or this term, okay? Um, but I, I, I assume that most of us know what uh, neoliberalism is, right? Um, but it, it's, a, it's a celebration of resilient subjects in the face of an unchangeable status quo. And, it, and it's a way in which it becomes this almost weird, perverse triumphalism of people who can um, supposedly innovatively cope, right? With a world that has left them behind or that's unjust, but that they have very little opportunity to change. And what I want to argue is that this is a new form of soft power. And it's a type of soft power that moves from the heroic of this kind of like American triumphalism of the superhero to instead the heroism of the resilient subject. Okay. So really now to, to be heroic is to cope, right? Who's the best at coping, right? Um, and I want to argue that this shows the need to move from kind of preserving corporate hegemony to transforming it. We have to rethink art in many ways and popular art towards heroic stories or narratives that are much more about the ways in which people come together to create alternatives, okay? Right, is everyone still with me? Okay. Right on. So I assume most of you know what soft power is. Uh, so I'm not going to go fully too much into it, right? But in a sense, we can look at soft power in the very particulars of the theories by Joseph Nye, um, which are you know, uh, somewhat interesting. I wouldn't say they're as in-depth or sophisticated as, you know, other theories of power by any means. But in this context, I mean, they're, they're quite instrumental in that they show like, how do you actually wield a type of power that's not both based on coercion, right? Now, at a deeper level, this speaks to questions of cultural hegemony. And probably the most known theorist of this um, is Antonio Gramsci, uh, the Italian Marxist uh, from the 1920s and 30s. Um, and this is about the ways in which, you know, dominant values, right, um, are used as a means of binding uh, societies together in a kind of shared and naturalized common sense, right? Um, so I wanna talk about both in this lecture because I think they're uh, both relevant, um, but just to kind of give an example, um, um, and again, if this is very banal for most, um, I apologize. So, um, but again, I, I think uh, one example uh, of um, kind of soft power might be Hollywood. It's a very good example here. Uh, we can look at things like superhero movies like Captain America, etc. We can also look at the ways in which, you know, the very medium itself of film in Hollywood, right? It becomes this really interesting thing in which like, you know, people see the United States as, uh, you know, a kind of interesting and desirable place. It also helps to, in a sense, mitigate some of its actual and broader human rights offenses and imperialism around the world kind of by presenting it 
the very kind of popular way is like, you know, this is the US people and they're just like everyone else, but it's very interesting. Um, one uh, an example I often give about this and I, I still find it very interesting is like, you know, um, and, and I'll put on the gallery uh, view if I can. Um, it's, it's funny, I mean, I always find it very interesting uh, when I come over, when I, not, well, I live in Europe, um, but you know, that people like to show friends. Um, and I still think it's quite popular. Um, so this is an example. Um, so who here watches Friends? Some of you? Okay, uh, I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble for saying this. Ever. I mean, it's very interesting because, you know, uh, I think that people from New York, a lot more from the most part, uh, really dislike the show because it's such an unrealistic perception of what New York is and what New York life is. And the fact that they live in these huge apartments in the middle of Manhattan um, that, you know, uh, would be completely unaffordable by almost everyone at a time in the early 90s uh, when I was uh, actually, um, God, I was going to say young person, that makes me even sound more of an old person. <laughs> when I was a teenager, right? Like, I mean, you looked at that and you just thought, you know, rents are going sky high. I mean, this is completely everything we stand against. And yet, you know, this kind of represented a very whitewashed, both literal and figurative view of one, a city that, I mean, has anyone ever been to New York? Some? Uh, I mean, New York has a lot of issues, uh, but New York's incredibly multicultural, right? You you might not see it if you watch uh, Friends, but it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful city in that sense. But it's also, I mean, it's not really like how it is in Manhattan, right? I mean, that's a very small slice of it. Now, I bring this up because that's an example of culture used to soft power, right? So you look at the United States, you can understand the fact that it is an imperial power. You can understand the fact that it's 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 not a, a positive force in the world uh, in terms of its militarism, in terms of the way that it economically exploits, particularly countries in the global south. But your main engagement with it is Hollywood movies and TV shows, right? There's a deeper form of common sense, and this is a Gramscian kind of hegemony, um, which is the ways in which certain types of values are promoted, right? And they're just naturalized. So this idea of hard work, for instance, it's a very famous one, right? Like that it's really valuable to work hard. Now, this is a very kind of capitalist value, right? Like, I mean, we want you to work as hard as you can at your job, right? And in fact, like there's all sorts of alternative values we can have, like maybe as humans, we should link ideas of progress to not having to work so hard, right? But if you said to someone, particularly like, I think in the United States, like, wow, I don't want to work hard, right? They'd probably see that not as in a political opinion or social, but they would just look at that as immoral because it's the common sense that you should work hard. And um, that's the, uh, what I hope is the most boring part of the, the show, so to speak, because now we can get more into the uh, fun parts. Um, now, like I said, I, I'm not a particular fan of how Justin Knight does soft power, but one thing I wanted to talk about is how it is a fantasy. And I want to talk a little bit more deeply about it as a type of fantasy, as opposed to just a kind of idea of um, it as traditionally seen, um, particularly when spoken about by people like Joseph and I. So he kind of has this idea, like a country may obtain the outcomes it wants in world politics because of other countries, admiring its values, emulating its example, inspiring to its level of prosperity and openness and want to follow it. In this sense, it is also important to set the agenda and track others in world politics and not only force them to change by threatening military force or economic sanctions. This soft power getting others to want outcomes that you want co-ops people rather than coerces them. Now, there's a couple very interesting parts about this, right? Um, so some of the work that I do is looking at what I would call affective fantasies. Um, so the kinds of ways in which dominant values and discourses can grip you emotionally and psychologically. So I'm not here talking about things like The Hobbit, right? I'm talking about something much deeper. Um, though, though I guess Lord of the Rings is a pretty deep thing, maybe, um, if you like Neoplaton, Neoplatonism and Christianity. Um, so in this sense, I'm talking about the ways in which we form identifications with this, right? And in doing so, uh, 
we begin to form a sense of individual and collective self around these kinds of very deep psychic fantasies. Um, and they become in many ways this kind of almost affective drama upon which our entire identity can uh, be based around, right? Um, a, a famous example, uh, well, I don't know, famous example, but like your first infatuation, right? Like the first crush you might have on someone, right? Like it's the fantasy of that. And, and your entire self for like a month can be completely on like this idea of what if I'm with this person, my life would be perfect. But there's a whole drama, right? Around the fact like, these are all the things stopping me from being with this person, right? Now, this is obviously just like a very limited example. But when you look at something more broadly at a collection, you can look at things like uh, nationalism, right? You get a real sense in which, you know, you can identify with, for instance, being British, being Dutch, uh, being from the US. And you get all sorts of what Jacques Lacan with uh, a French psychoanalysis um, would say is duessence, uh, right? A sense of enjoyment, right? Partial enjoyment. And you get enjoyment, ironically, from the disappointment that it never fully comes true, right? Uh, so some of the work I've done at an organizational level is this idea of work-life balance, for instance. Like, it's not that we actually can achieve work-life balance in a capitalist society. It's that we invest in this idea of, I have to work harder and harder to become a balanced subject. And you have this idea that if you can achieve this balance, everything will be perfect, right? That there's this utopian state of being balanced, right? And you actually put a huge amount of labor and set your entire uh, self around being a balanced subject. Um, I really like the fact uh, that uh, I'm talking about work-life balance and I see someone like chugging a beer in the back. That's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> that's right on. That's like the best part of the thing. Uh, that's how I feel about work-life balance too. Like if anyone would have touched you that, just pull out a beer and start drinking because uh, that's probably the best uh, way you can achieve it. Um, now, what I like about this quote is that I want us to deconstruct what soft power is for a moment before getting into how it's spread. Because soft power itself is really complicated. I mean, it's really difficult to actually show how does like American uh, films, for instance, spread, for instance, uh, you know, corporate interest from America around the world, right? But what it does is it creates a sense of fantasy. And I wanna show two ways of fantasy here, right? One is from the position of, and I use these terms very, very broadly, um, but from the colonized and one is from the colonizer, okay? So from the colonized, this idea of fantasy of like, for instance, even those who may be, have been negatively infected uh, by the United States have this really strong phantasmatic idea that the United States can be a land of freedom, right? And what becomes interesting about this is that the very forces of capitalism, which are exploiting and oppressing them, also become a fantasy of, well, if we just had the free market like them, right, we would actually be as developed, okay? So this becomes a really interesting perverse fantasy that the system that's oppressing you also becomes a system in which you aspire and strive for, okay? The second part of this, though, is uh, the ways in which from the colonizer point of view, right? You like to believe that people are following you because for instance, right? Um, in a sense, you think, oh, well, people just believe what I believe and they like our values. When in fact, it's a much more realist assumption oftentimes. Um, if I can be uh, so bold to talk about for a moment before going on um, Brexit, for instance, the United Kingdom, right? I always found it very interesting uh, living in, in the UK, um, when people would ask me, well, are you for the UK staying or not? And I would always say, well, absolutely I am for it. And they said, oh, that's because you think the EU is this wonderful moral place. And I said, absolutely not. The EU is incredibly imperialist. I don't have any normative belief in the EU, but the fact of the matter is, is that it's a moral hazard, right? I mean, the only reason the EU is nice to the UK is because it's a member. The minute the UK starts being a member, well, ask Northern African countries how nice the EU is in negotiations. Ask Latin American countries, right? So I say this not because I think the EU is particularly bad or the UK is good. I'm saying this because there's a way in which the UK 
hadn't really fully, you know, taken on, that there's a realist point in which whether you like the EU or not, you're probably better staying in, you know, the world's largest market than staying out for no other reason than it's better to be, you know, I mean, you know, why upset your local imperialist, so to speak, right? Now, that's not the point of this talk, and I'm sorry if like, uh, uh, you know, I mean, obviously that's a complex thing, but what I'm saying about that is that in many ways, the U.S., for instance, has a fantasy that people follow the U.S. because of the fact that they like its movies, right? Or it's like its values and freedom. A lot of countries follow the U.S. because it has the largest military. And if they don't, there's all sorts of consequences, right? So I do want to talk about this as a type of fantasy. Okay. So traditionally there's been a kind of soft fantasy of American exceptionalism. Um, and I, I'm not gonna go fully into it because I, I think most of us know it. One of the, my favorite, and one uh, I wrote a journalism article about it was Interstellar. So has any has most people seen Interstellar? Um, yeah, apparently you can break the laws of physics just through love. Um, I love my son profoundly. Um, I can't even get him to put on his shoes, but uh, he can break the laws of physics. So um, nevertheless, um, what I found really interesting was that this whole movie was about human possibility. And at the end, it had a flag of the, of the United States. So in, in this certain sense, it's like we're breaking the bounds of possibility. We're reshaping ontologically what it means to be alive and exist, right? In a different type of world, going out into the vast universe of space in which our insignificance becomes a strength and that we open ourselves to all new ways of being. Nevertheless, this country that's 250 years old and, you know, it's still going to be a, a main identity. Um, I, I do hope that if I end up living on Mars, um, it's either not in some kind of Elon Musk libertarian hellscape or some place in which I still have to pledge allegiance to some earthly flag, right? Like the whole point is that you would hope that you get beyond such national identifications. But I just found it interesting that, you know, in this example, like there's this fantasy that was going through that even at the largest outreaches of art telling us about human possibility, it couldn't think outside of nationalism, right? Now, I put this out here because, you know, I'm very happy to go through a whole history. Um, well, maybe not so happy because uh, I don't know how long you have, but like, uh, you know, the use of uh, a place like the United States and Cold War propaganda and different fantasies of triumphalism, right? But I found this quite interesting because this was made in 2014, six years after the financial crisis. It's not a, um, I wouldn't say Interstellar is some reactionary or right-wing uh, piece of work, right? This isn't something you'd watch and you would just say, oh, wow, I mean, this was directed by someone who watches Fox News or, you know, CNN or something. Um, but what I did find really interesting was that even amidst that, there was this kind of American triumphalism, right? Now, that was made in 2014. A lot's happened in, uh, in the seven years since then, right? Um, and I want to talk about this idea again of the American dream in crisis. And I use the American dream here importantly because it's not just in the US, but I think the very underpinnings of it this kind of free market sense, right? This notion of pulling yourself from your bootstraps. I mean, I think that things like the financial crisis in 2008, the uh, COVID-19 epidem pandemic, uh, climate change, I think, um, I mean, I would be very interested um, to know the extent to which I, I think for people of my generation, the Iraq war was a, was a important turning point um, I'm not actually sure to the degree that it still remains that. Um, uh, but nevertheless, like, I think that even in seven years, that sense of triumphalism, right, has largely dissipated. I think it's very hard now to have this kind of very optimistic notion, right, that we're going in the right direction, uh, that this is going to be the American century again, quote unquote, et cetera. Um, 
So how has Hollywood responded to that? Okay. Well, I want to start by talking about uh, a book by the late uh, and really sadly departed um, author Mark Fisher um, uh, of Capitalist Realism. Um, if you're, has anyone read Capitalist Realism or heard of it? Okay, um, so uh, I'll give you a, a very brief background. I'm not going to force you to do a book report after this, but right, Mark Fisher was a really brilliant uh, theorist and critical thinker, as well as um, if you're ever interested, I think they're still an archive. One of the best uh, review music reviewers of punk music ever. Um, his blogs are incredible. Uh, so, but he wrote something very interesting, right? That was quite important, which was the really strong, I would say grip of capitalism ideologically was not what you would find in something like uh, really existing socialism, like Stalinism, right? Or fascism, uh, Mussolini or Hitler right? Where this is clearly an ideology, right? And it's also not something that you have to believe in, right? While a lot of people do believe in it, right? It's not something you have to believe in, okay? One, all it requires, and this is a point by Louise uh, Souser, um, is a sense of, you know, uh, uh, accepting it, right? In a very kind of ritualistic way, right? Like when you go to work, uh, you know, I'll give you an example, like your teachers at school, or if you go to work, they don't really care if you believe in school or work. They just care that you show up on time, right? That's it. Like, you know, as long as you show up, like you could believe in it or not, like who cares, right? Um, not, not to make you not, I mean, I care if you believe in it, I guess. I mean, but you know, um, but there's something even deeper here. Capitalism obviously requires our material reproduction and exploitation, okay? So it just cares that you go to work and you do what you're supposed to do. But on an ideological level, it doesn't even require that you believe in it. It requires that you don't think there are any alternatives, right? That you say, I know this isn't great, or maybe this isn't wonderful, but what else can you do? And, you know, some of the work that I've done on the back of this is to start thinking about how does already there ha this capitalism have within its phantasmatic structure, okay, I and mean, it's kind of ideologies, a, a sense of escape that never escapes it. So think about the idea that you're constantly working towards retirement, right? Like your entire reason for working, for engaging in capitalism is to escape it without actually thinking, could there be a system in which I don't have to spend my entire life just trying to escape this thing, right? Alternatively, you've probably heard this a lot, like if you've ever said like, this is horrible and they said, well, what else would you do, right? What would be a different system if the market didn't rule it, right? So, you know, in a sense, I, I'm not doing full justice to this, but capitalist realism is a sense of just be realistic, right? Like that's how capitalism, perpetuates itself. It's the only realistic system. So you have to simply accept it, whether you believe in its moral good or not. Now, this has given rise to what I've called resilient capitalism. Okay. And it's not just myself, there's uh, other people, but looking at this from an organizational level of work, um, but also at broader levels of social discourse. I mean, you see this again and again and again and again, which is how do you become a more resilient subject, right? How do you cope with things better, right? Um, one of the things I found really interesting um, is for early university students and people um, going into universities, right? Like, I mean, uh, sorry, can you, can you still hear me? Okay. I can't speak for the Netherlands. But I could say in the UK and the US, I mean, when they say millennials don't work, I, I'm, I'm blown away. I mean, the level of anxiety, I mean, from 10 years old, it seems, if not earlier, you're already thinking about your CV. I mean, personally, at 12 years old, I don't think you should be playing a music instrument because it's good to get you into university, right? But 
I mean, this level of anxiety and, and personally, I mean, I, I, I can say for myself, like, you know, I, I've been very fortunate, uh, both because of white male privilege, but also, you know, I mean, um, but, you know, I certainly made mistakes before I was 18 in a way that I don't think is so forgiving nowadays, right? Um, and I all of a sudden see all these new age discourses of let's teach young people mindfulness. Let's teach them to meditate. Let's teach them to cope better. It's like, well, maybe they don't need to cope better. Maybe we need to deal with the structural realities of forcing them to be working 60 hours as students, right? Maybe that's not the best way in which we think. Maybe their mental health would be improved, right? If they didn't meditate so much and we just gave them less work and more opportunity to explore critically life, right? But you see this all around. Like, this isn't just an example, right? You see this in general, and I'll get into more than, but like, we're not, there's an idea that we're not actually here to, 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 to change the system. You can't do that, but you can make people more resilient, right? Um, one of my favorite examples of this that I, 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 um, I often teach is, um, has, uh, oh, I'll put this up here. Um, so most of you know about Foxconn, right? If you can see your mobile phone, right? So um, interestingly, Whenever you have a, well, uh, I, sh I should ask this. This will be part of the question and answer uh, part. Um, well, no, I, I don't want to waste too much. But, um, so everyone talks about Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs didn't invent anything. Apple doesn't do anything with technology. These are, you know, what Steve Jobs did globally was to convince people to buy the same product every year at more cost, right? So, Every year when you get an update on iPhone and you have to, because we're all professional photographers suddenly, so we need the top camera in our phone, right? When you have that, that means that people are, you know, workers around the world in sweatshops, such as Foxconn in China, have to work 17 hours a day for a month without bathroom breaks oftentimes in horrible conditions. And it leads to a spate of suicides. Now, this hasn't led to better working conditions when this was exposed. Right. This didn't create a situation where we said, well, maybe we shouldn't, you know, be buying iPhones every year. So there's not, you know, a degrowth mentality or even, well, maybe we can have better working conditions um, around this. What happened was for these workers, they just put in place things like, well, if you're really feeling suicidal, instead of committing suicide during your off time, you can go down and beat up a doll and pretend it's your boss. Right. So obviously, actually, this didn't do much for suicides, uh, but um, nevertheless, this was the mentality. Right. We're not going we're just going to try to make you more resilient. OK. Now. I want to talk about, in this sense, two particular pieces of art that I think represent a type of resilient soft power. Right. Or the ways in which. We're creating new heroic fantasies using US art, okay, and media around the resilient subject. And it's a subject in which you feel heroic, not in changing the system, not in working with others to transform it, not in finding alternatives, but in coping with it. Okay. Is everyone still with me? All right, right on. So the first is uh, President Obama. So President Obama, who has read uh, his recent memoir? Has anyone? No? Okay. Um, you know, there, there was a time in which he was like an icon of cool, I think. Um, maybe not. Uh, I, I will say uh, last time I was in the United States and uh, they said, oh, it's the classic rock weekend. And I thought, oh, that's fantastic. They're going to play music from the 70s. And what they meant was Nirvana. Uh, so I'm classic rock now, so uh, I don't know what's cool. Um, but nevertheless, um, now I find this very interesting because if, you, if you've if you read other presidential memoirs, and I'm not saying that you have to read them, right? Um, you're not usually gonna find something quite as erudite as Obama's book. And I will say this, 
for whatever else you may agree or disagree with his policies um, or what he's done or whatever, he's clearly a very brilliant, brilliant mind, right? And he clearly has a very strong sense of politics and aggressive policies, right? This is not someone, um, I mean, with all due respect uh, to some others, um, I'm not sure if I would get that same level of analysis, for instance, about you know the proper level of the marginal tax rate from Donald Trump. Um, maybe, but not from the experience I've seen on television. Um, that said, this book, which is the first volume, it's like 700 pages. So it's a book, it's a doorstop uh, if you buy it in hardback, right? Um, it takes a small force to uh, to justify an empire, um, right? It's this really interesting thing because of all the books that I've ever read by an American politician, it really is probably the most insightful and intelligent. Okay, and it was it was a bestseller. Um, I think, uh, um, you know, um, and I would say that very few people would say and read this and think, okay, this is the epitome of American soft power and, you know, reactionary conservative discourse, right? Um, now, what's really interesting about it, though, is what he says. And in many ways, right, Obama does something that is extraordinary. Now, to understand this, um, we have to understand a book that was written before this. So has anyone read Hillary Clinton's Hard Choices? Okay, some of you, right? Okay, some not. Uh, I wouldn't say that you're totally missing something if, if you had, uh, but, right? Now, what becomes really interesting about that is that for Clinton, she wrote this really justifying her time as Secretary of State, and there was no real critique in it. It was more about the fact that there was like, you know, in global politics, inherently, there's hard choices you have to make. And I was willing to make them. And that's why I would be a good president. And there's nothing really about American militarism or the system or anything like that, right? Rather, it's about, you know, the inherent difficulties of making hard choices in a difficult, morally difficult world, right? Um, I don't really understand how, you know, deciding to support a right-wing oligarchy in um, Honduras is a hard moral choice, but she sees it as such, okay? Now, you could go to, Clinton, to Obama and say the same thing, but he doesn't. He says something much more, I think, important. And, and to be honest, I think if I'm, if I'm being really, really honest, I mean, he's a much more sophisticated political thinker and actor, um, which is, it's, he, has, he has no compunction about saying the American system is broken. Throughout his entire book, it's really about the American system is broken. He came to power, he wanted to do certain things, you couldn't do it, it's completely broken, um, so instead he begins to justify all those policies that he made that people have said, why didn't you go further? Right. And the way he justifies this is by saying, well, you know, um, corporations are incredibly, uh, powerful, uh, bipartisanship and systemic racism are incredibly powerful. So there's only so much you can do in this system. And if you try to do more, well, you're just dreaming, right? Now, I think recent events have shown completely opposite. I mean, really all it took was, uh, uh, um, you know, one, two unsuccessful, but popular progressive campaigns by a politician who policies would be considered center right in Europe for the most part. <laughs> to suddenly all of a sudden show someone like Joe Biden, who's traditionally an extraordinarily right wing, uh, and we have to say, oh, well, things can change, right? So obviously, 
emp empirically, historically, this is shown even within a very short time to be incorrect. But the point is, is that he cast himself as this heroic figure. And whereas in 2008, he was a heroic figure of change and hope, however empty this was, now he is a heroic figure of resiliency. I know the system is broken. I know the system can't really be fundamentally changed, but I can still make small changes. And that makes me resilient, right? So there's a real sense, and, and I think I heard one of you say that you might do something around narrative and things. I mean, this is the kind of things that might be interesting. I mean, he cast this narrative, right? This narrative of, I came in as an optimist and I came out in terms of resiliency. And it's not a tragedy for him. It's a heroic struggle. And it's a maturity he sees it as, you know? Now, again, more systemic critiques that have been made against the administration, such as, well, we didn't have to take all that Wall Street money, right? Or you could have actually relied on really building up progressive movements, or you could have actually gone to the uh, population more and really made this a popular issue. Um, you didn't have to actually uh, help to bankrupt local democratic parties, even if it was a center, center right party. Like, I mean, so you could have actually had progressives in local elections. There's all sorts of things. Gosh forbid, I mean, you could have actually promoted alternative forms of economic systems and shown how they could be better at a local and national level. Um, all sorts of things you could do. One thing you didn't have to do was just cave into corporations at every moment because you wanted their money. But nevertheless, his view is, I came, I couldn't conquer, so I survived, right? And anybody who questions this is living in a, a dream world, right? Now, why I think this is important is because in a certain sense, right, you also see this within all sorts of discourses happening now, right? Um, so for instance, uh, right now, um, it's very sad, but uh, uh, such a Jackson, a major uh, Black Lives Matter um, figure was shot today in London, uh, shot yesterday in London, right? And why, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why this is sad and, um, sorry, I just want to take, I mean, it's very sad. Um, but, uh, you know, because we're having these things, but there's people, you know, who are, you know, really fighting on the front lines, obviously. But, you know, one of the things about this that's happened is something like Black Lives Matters, which in a very deep way is saying, how do you count life that matters? What life is expendable and which life is not, right? How is it resilient that you have a drone warfare system that has massive civilian casualties? Why is that collateral damage? Who gets to be collateral damage and who doesn't, right? Who gets to be resilient and who doesn't, right? Was the half a million people and civilians who died in Iraq, were they, in many ways, were they resilient, right? And also you can kind of begin to see very early these types of discourses around like, well, you know, yes, it might be hard, but they rebuild themselves, okay? So in a sense, there's a soft power thing about the fact that it's telling to all of you and all people who want real fundamental change, it can't happen. You just have to learn to be pragmatic. You have to learn to be resilient. You have to learn to make the small reforms, right? Now, again, I think this is largely shifting and I think why I see this as soft power is because I think this has actually been weaponized, right? This is not just a defense of a president who clearly has to face charges that he didn't, you know, achieve what he set out to achieve, even in the least in many ways, right? This is about a global superpower that doesn't seem to have answers for major public health crises, for ecological crises, right? And for a way in which increasingly there's a sense in which, well, why do we have this system? What could be different? So that's the first, I, I like to call it liberal realism because it's a sense in which you can't really go beyond present day realism. There is no alternative, right? So you just have to be resilient. 
Now, the second is um, Nomadland. Now, and I call this resilient neoliberalism. All right, um, so who's seen Nomadland? No? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, so it did win the Oscar. Uh, I don't think that means anything anymore, um, necessarily. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Um, so who's heard of Nomadland at least? No? Oh, wow, okay. So it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Uh, okay, so um, let me see. Uh, am I way over time? I'm sorry. Uh, so I'll be very quick. So No Man Land is, a, is an Oscar winning movie uh, that uh, is about uh, this female protagonist who comes from a town that because of corporate globalization um, pretty much literally died. So it no longer was a postcode because the factory shut. And she becomes what they call one of these um, now modern day nomads. So she lives out of a van and she goes from kind of job to job to job to job. And it's kind of an exploration of the freedom that this can give, right? And also a sense of perseverance and resilience. Uh, Francis McDormand won um, Academy Award for this. Now, one of the critiques of it was the fact that it was um, that, you know, like a lot of nomads, she works, she oftentimes will work shifts, um, especially at high seasonal uh, times, like during Christmas, at Amazon. And it portrayed Amazon as like this, you know, fairly nice working thing. Now, everyone knows that's not the case. And there's been huge amounts of critiques of that. Um, but what becomes really interesting about it is that even though it's a beautiful movie, and it really is a beautiful movie, so, um, you know, um, nevertheless, it does present this resilient neoliberalism. So instead of a movie about, wow, what would have happened if this uh, industry wasn't controlled by, uh, by, you know, international market forces? If we didn't allow corporations just to leave whenever they wanted to? What would happen to this factory was actually worker owned? What if it was part of a value chain that was cooperative? What if you had more socialist principles, right? What would happen if you didn't have situations in which entire towns literally died and the people had to move away and they didn't, because you know they've lived their whole life, right? That they didn't have to live out of a van, right? If you are interested in moving be beyond nuclear family, heteronormative ideas, couldn't it be more than you're doing it out of economic necessity? Couldn't we think of a different type of life where people don't feel so constrained that they have to live in the same place their whole life or only move because of a job, right? Why does it, this have to be a sense of resiliency? There should be a sense of anger. There should be a sense of wanting to do differently. And instead it's a movie about resiliency and coping. Now, again, it's very beautiful. And the actually nomadic lifestyle, and they had a lot of people who were modern day nomads, and it was beautiful the way it was done. Okay. Um, as you can tell, I'm not a very good film critic because I just say beautiful a lot, uh, which means a lot of different things. Um, but um, nevertheless, I bring this up because it does present this heroic idea of resilient neoliberalism. You don't need to change neoliberalism, you just need to find ways to be more resilient in it, more coping with it, right? Um, in many ways, I think, you know, the intersectionality that we've seen of this, like, it's probably very different, but I remember in the United States, for instance, um, like when I was growing up in the early 1990s, right? There's a real sense in like, you know, when it came to things like LGBT, LGBTQ rights, right? You, well, we can't really change people's minds, but what we can do is teach you how to be more resilient. And it's like, no, we don't need to teach people how to be more resilient. We need to teach society how to be more tolerant, right? And it's a similar type of discourse, right? It's a way in which we're saying, we don't need to change the system. We just need to find ways to make people cope better. And isn't this a great example? And I put this picture uh, of a, a woman at an Amazon factory because in response to a lot of critiques that this have had, including from the men, 
they haven't actually changed any of their working practices. What they've done is put in meditation pods. So now at the beginning of a shift for 10 minutes, you can uh, meditate and reflect apparently. Um, I guess uh, they don't want you to reflect on uh, global proletariat revolution, but on other things. So what I would like to argue is that American soft power has moved from triumphalism to one of resilience. And now it's trying to create a heroic narrative, particularly for younger people who don't buy into traditional forms of exceptionalism of, well, even if you don't buy it, you don't have to fake it, but there's no other option. And you just have to learn to be more resilient. And it creates a new narrative of the heroic resilient subject. So what I'd like to say to you is don't buy in to resiliency because what you're just doing is preserving the empire, a dying empire. You're preserving a system that clearly doesn't work and it's not good for your well-being. Don't be resilient, be transformational. And don't buy soft power attempts that try to get you to be resilient, right? because another world is possible and it's not gonna happen for months just coping better with the one that we're given. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bloom. Um, uh, with that, I'd like to open up a Q and A. Um, again, feel free to just raise your hand through Zoom. I'll call your name and you can just speak up. Um, you can also ask your questions in the YouTube live chat or in the comments or also just here in the chat, whatever you feel comfortable with. It was either that bad or that good, I guess. <laughs> um, maybe I can start off with, uh, with a question myself. Um, you talk quite a bit about different movies and impact that they have had. Is there something that you can say maybe about your upbringing, uh, maybe an American movie that you watched that kind of had an influence of how you see the country? Um, and have you realized that that might have been wrong or, or something like that? Um, yeah, I mean, many, many. Um, so I think that clearly, I mean, on the one hand, uh, I grew up around G.I. Joe. So, I mean, you know, um, I was a, I wouldn't say I was a pre-teen McCarthyist, but you know, I mean, we. Were, I think it's also very different, difficult in Europe to, and I, and I say this often to my partner, my wife. Um, for a similar regard, I mean, to grow up in a in an actual global military superpower, is very you know. So I grew up with around a lot of militarism. Um, I guess now when I watch Rambo, I enjoy it at a kind of like unintentional comedy level. But at the time, I took it quite seriously. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, including the Muha, you know, supporting the Mujahideen as heroic fighters, apparently. Um, but also I would say that the early nineties was a, something similar happened in the sense that um, I think that there was a lot of cynicism and that cynicism often translated into a different type of situation similar to now, which, you know, I mean, it was very hard to justify how great America was in the early 90s because in many ways it wasn't. Um, and um, I think that when you had shows to show, including ones that I like, like Seinfeld, for instance, um, which I'm not sure is even popular anymore, but you know, um, there was a certain sense in which you just became a very cynical subject, like you, you rejected corporations, et cetera. But there was also a sense like, what could you do, right? So there's, you know, a famous example in an article I really like about this, about, you know, the cynical subject of work um, by Peter Fleming and Andre Spicer, right? Talks about how, like, you know, and, and I was a subject like this, like, you know, you kind of work at McDonald's and while saying, would you like fries with that underneath your uniform, you'd have a mixed shit shirt on and you got your enjoyment in many ways from a sense of like, you know, feeling you were above it all because, you know, you knew that this was bullshit. But in the end, I mean, it didn't, they didn't care what you were wearing under their uniform as long as you, you know, gave people fries for minimum wage. Um, so I think I would say, you know, on two levels, I would say I was definitely indoctrinated with quite militaristic films very early on. Um, and then um, later, I think I was indoctrinated with, you know, a very type of cynical, but nevertheless non-radical uh, 
kind of artistic cultural experience. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. I mean, I'm happy to go through all the ways in which I know every line from Predator, if you would like. But uh, <laughs> we do have another question now um, asked by um, Alexander on YouTube. Um, he asked, "What would be an act that defined that defies resilience? Uh, is it rioting, voting, boycotting?" Well, okay, I think I think a couple things on this. I think that um, it's a really great question. So I think that all those things can defy resilience, like, and I think it has to be, you know, moment to moment and uh, struggle to struggle. One thing I would like to say in this context is, have you ever asked why you don't see more films, if any films, or think about when was the last film you actually saw that was dramatic, okay, or even funny, about an alternative organization, about a work, about, you know, instead of a worker-owned co-op, for instance, or a community that was based on commons ownership. These aren't things that don't exist, right? But they're things that are not reflected and represented. So I would say in this context, I think there's all sorts of political acts that are not just about resilience. But I would like to point out that I think a key aspect that is missing within our kind of you know, cultural context and the emotion of cultural power is the celebration and the creation of different types of fantasies around, you know, creating alternatives, mm -hmm. alternative ways of life. Um, and, and I think that, that that's quite important. Um, I, I remember, uh, I remember uh, the, the, just to give you a sense that this might be a bit of a joke, but uh, do you remember uh, the recent, well, I don't know how recent it is, um, horror movie that was set in Sweden and then they made a, a American things, uh, Let the Right Ones In about the vampire, right? Do you guys, did anyone watch that? No, okay. Sure. So I won't, I won't go into like what it's about, but it's a, it's a horror movie. It's wonderful about vampires in Sweden. And I remember watching with an American friend of ours and I looked at them, but they looked at me and uh, they didn't know much about social democracy, to be honest, because they were in the US. And I said, I said, what do you think of this? You're scared because you're kind of smiling. And they said, are these how poor people live in Sweden? And I'm like, yeah, man, like they have a safety net. He's like, this is awesome. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, they have like a two bedroom apartment and he like, he works in a factory. And I'm like, yeah, th that that's, I mean, it's not social, it's, it's social democratic. I'm like, but I think you're missing the point. Like there's a vampire around, it's killing, he's like, yeah, I could live with a vampire if I got like reduced rent. That'd be cool. I could do that. <laughs> and he says, so wait a minute. And I remember like, you know, at one point I think of the film, but he's like, so they don't have to pay for healthcare. I'm like, no, nah, man, you don't pay for healthcare for in Europe. He's like, do you pay for healthcare? I'm like, well, with my tech, no. He's like, but how does that work? I'm like, you're missing the point of the story. There's a vampire going around. This is not a story about like not having to pay for healthcare. Now I bring that up because you know, this is a really funny example, but it's, a, it's also an example of like, in a sense, he was watching this and he saw, you know, which isn't even a radical alternative. I, I don't think anyone would say Sweden is a radical country, right? But he saw an alternative, right? So how many alternatives do you see in art? How many sitcoms do you turn on that present a lifestyle that's not heteronormative, right? How many sitcoms do you see and turn on that show a life that isn't capitalist, right? And I think that's an important thing that I wanna point out that in terms of, I think a non-resilience-based art would be art that is willing to show alternatives and the struggles to make alternatives as opposed to the struggles either to resist existing power structures or be resilient in the face of them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And maybe what we can do is actively reach out and try to find art to consume that mm. is different from what's heteronormative. Absolutely. Um, then I would like to give the word to Anna to ask her question. Yes, uh, thank you for the great lecture. I was wondering, uh, so you explained how cultural depictions of uh, kind of move to resilience under capitalism. Um, how do you see these cultural depictions of corporate hegemony uh, develop in the upcoming years? 
in which direction? I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, first of all, I like your title. It's Secretary and what? Commissioner of External uh, Affairs. That's super rad. Like, you guys have like super cool titles. <laughs> I'm going to talk to my wife, like, we've been stuck at our house for so long, we're going to start, I, I want to be that. Uh, <laughs> it's like that uh, Simpsons episode where Homer started his uh, own company of just him, and he made himself vice president of technology, and his wife, and Marge goes, why are you vice president of a company you founded? And he goes, well, Marge, you don't become CEO on the first day. <laughs> um, okay, but I, I think that there's a lot of different ways this is going to go, okay? On the one hand, I think you're going to begin to see this idea of let's just get back to normal and normal so it becomes this fantasy, right? Um, and, and I see that already happening a lot, right? Where it's like, oh, when the pandemic is over, we can go back to normal. I think another thing that you're going to start seeing is what, I, what others uh, have called kind of woke capitalism, which is like this idea, right, of, you know, corporate social responsibility, and working in really cool progressive places, et cetera. Um, and you already started to see a precedent of that um, in technology companies, right? I mean, if you ask people of Silicon Valley, they would say, oh, well, yeah, these are really progressive companies. And in fact, they're not. I mean, you know, for instance, you know, they've ruined San Francisco, <laughs> right? Um, but more than that, I mean, not more than that, in addition to the massive social costs they have, right? I mean. You just saw, like, uh, they hired a, an absolutely brilliant genius uh, black computer scientist, or actually at Google, to talk to them about, like, how do you start actually making your algorithms less racist? Um, and when she actually started to tell them that, they fired her. Um, so <laughs> I do think that you'll start to see, like, this kind of notion of, like, woke capitalism, where it's like, you know, you'll start to see more movies about the progressive ability of corporations to promote anti-racism, et cetera. Um, and then, I mean, I think that you'll see more of these kind of things of resiliency. I think you're gonna see more and more art that is about like how people supposedly survive, right? Um, and again, I, like I already kind of see it in some of the initial things, I mean, um, if you look at like how media depicts the Black Lives Matters movement, which is an, you know, a, a very diverse movement, obviously, but is, you know, an incredibly strong abolitionist movement that is about thinking of a society without prisons, thinking of a society that's not just based, not just tackling inequalities, but an entire society and world that's based on racial knowledges of inequality, right? How is it depicted? Well, it's depicted by like, look at these very strong, even in positive activists who somehow can learn to cope better with the racist system. And they're not trying to cope with the better racist system. They're trying to change this system, right? And in fact, one of the most interesting parts that you wouldn't hear, like when you say is like, you know, they've created all sorts of alternatives. Like for instance, you know, in Portland, they, they created the, um, chop area that was like you know experiment for two weeks when the the police station was so scared that they actually abandoned the police station they created across this whole i forget how many blocks i think it's four or five block area like you know this experiment this kind of you know anti-racist commune experiment of shared ownership um equality right and how much do you hear about that or about the ways in which they take over hotels and they allow them to be places for sheltering homeless people, right? Like these are things that you don't hear about, right? But are really important because they're not just about resistance or resilience. They're about creating another world today, about creating a different type of world today, right? So that's that's what I would say. Like, I, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, that would be a kind of important way um, that you would start challenging this resistance discourse, a resilience discourse. But I think it, I think it's quite strong still. Thank you. And did that answer your question? All right, perfect. Um, then I'd like to um, give the word to Maya to ask your question. 
Hey, um, thank you so much for the interesting lecture. I was wondering, and maybe you've already touched upon this a bit, but you talked about how we should strive to be rather um, transformative than uh, resilient. But um, resilience is something you can do quite individualistically and transformation is something you often need a group for, which is it's something more, yeah, collectivistic, I guess. So I was wondering if there are things that we can't immediately transform or that just aren't changing fast enough, or uh, should we still strive to be resilient in the circumstances that I think that I, I think that's a really good question. Um, so, and, and I didn't touch upon it. So, my I think it was really brilliant. Okay. Um, so, essentially, what you're asking is like, you know, it's all great to say transformation, but that's a collective activity. There's huge amounts of labor involved in this. Whereas, like on an everyday level, like I need to learn how to cope. I need to learn how to be resilient. Also, it's much more. It's much easier on an individual level to do this, right? I would say that I'm not against resilience. And, and the point of this thing wasn't to say that people shouldn't find ways to be resilient. It is though, was, I mean, the, the point of this was to talk about the ways in which, um, you know, I would say that corporate art is promoting a heroic discourse of being resilient at the expense of transformation. But I think you need to be able to do both, right? I think you need to find ways to be resilient and to forgive yourself. Right. Um, uh, you know, I, I'll give an example of, of something because I think it's important to share. Right. Like I, I used to be always in really good shape and then I gained a bit of weight, particularly after my son. And, you know, I, I, I now I'm losing it again, but I'm losing it because I changed my mindset because, you know, I used to like just feel really guilty every time I overeat. But then I realized you're eating because it's something that gives you happiness. Right. Like, it's all right. Don't feel guilty about it. Like, it doesn't make you a bad person. And like, you know, I obviously internalized that shit, right? Sorry, not shit. I internalized that discourse, right? And I taught myself how to be more resilient around this. Like, I went through the things that I did, like, when I quit drinking. Like, you know, like, okay, what, what's really at stake about this? Why am I doing this? Like, what's there's a different way I could find happiness? Could I still do this with food, but in a different way, right? That's resilience. Like, I'm not bringing down the corporate food culture, right? I'm just losing weight, right? <laughs> like, but I'm becoming more resilient. Now, I think on the other side of that though, part of the reason that we're stuck in this resilience is because they want us to be individuated, right? They don't want us to find collectivity. They don't want us to be engaged in collaboration, right? And also they don't want us to find out um, senses of alternatives, right? And in these ways, right, what it does is it, it creates a situation in which, you know, you can feel so isolated and alone and it's a cycle that you just continue to be resilient, you know? And I think some of the, the great things that we found, you know, around, you know, when people talk about, for instance, um, culture wars and identity politics, right? You hear that often now. I obviously can critique that from a level of like, I don't really think that we should just be involved in kind of liberal identity politics. I think we need more fundamental change, right? But something that is often missed is that if you come from a, a particular subject group, right? A historically marginalized group that feels completely isolated, like finding community is incredibly empowering, right? It can go from something that is like, I'm just surviving to I'm actually involved in changing things. And you know, it doesn't always have to be like, I'm talking about like, you know, a revolutionary change, right? It can be like a different type of living, a different type of existence and finding those communities to do so, right? And I think that in a certain sense, right? We need to balance the individual everyday realities of being resilient in the capitalist system with the, yes, more difficult, but 
more empowering ways of forming different types of collaborations and communities that lets us see there is an alternative. There is something different. We don't have to live this way, right? So I do think you need both, right? But I think that's the problem is that we are in resilience because most of us can't actually imagine what a different type of society would live like, right? And it's probably a bit different in the Netherlands, but you know, I mean, we question things like why does our system seem more well, how many times have you actually been involved in collaborative decision making from a young age? Right? One of the things um from an educational perspective in the um I always find this interesting, right? Um so your whole life when you you go to university, right? Or you get into, you're kind of like, I always find this very interesting is that um it's like students are very clearly like, I'm not intelligent. And it's like, well, you're maybe not intelligent in, or not everyone's intelligent, but maybe in this area, right? But like, maybe you have other types of wisdom. And because you didn't grow up in a system in which from a very young age, you learned to collaborate, you did things together. You never actually found what is your wisdom, right? And I think that's a big point. So instead you just become resilient as opposed to, I can actually work together with people and change the world, right? And I have something to offer to that. Does that make sense? Uh, cool. Thank you very much. Uh, um, someone asked something in chat, I think. Um, yes, Joanna. Um, asks, uh, why do you think young people nowadays are generally more anxious in comparison to people in the past? Life wasn't really easier 20 or more years ago. I don't think life was easier and I don't wanna generalize. Um, I think people are more anxious in the past for several reasons and it's not entirely, but I think one. Um, and again, if, if I'm wrong about this, please tell me. Um, but I think, uh, I think social media is fantastic. And I think people are like, oh, I was like, no, but I mean, when you're living your life that it's archived, like, I mean, it can be very, very stressful, right? Um, it's one thing when you're 15 and you drink for the first time and you get drunk and say something stupid and no one remembers it. And it's another thing when someone captures it on a phone and shares it with all your friends. And then 20 years later, you know, that like your kids might see it, right? Like, right. So I do think that there's an anxiety in knowing that you're constantly being, that, you know, I, like, yeah, I, I think that part, I could be wrong about that, by the way. Um, I think another thing though is, I think that it's just the level and logic of competition, not that life has come easier, has become much more difficult, uh, much more entrenched in a certain sense. Um, so I think that from a much, much younger age, people are engaged in um, feeling like I have to do this, this, or this. Otherwise, like, uh, you know, my life is going to be a failure, right? Um, I mean, think about the idea, just the notion, and this is something that like, if as a university professor, if I could change, think about the idea of telling an 18 year old, you have to know what you want to do for the rest of your life. And that's incredible, like, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, what do you, no, no offense, you know, a lot of things at 18, but you don't know a lot of things, you know, and that's good, like, you shouldn't, right? Um, but yeah, no, Joy, you're saying, so I, I think that's another reason that it is more anxious, like, um, I also think that we, it's not that life is easier, but it's, 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 it's more precarious, you know, I mean, just basic things are less secure. Um, I think it's harder to find a job. I think it's harder to get material security. And I also think that, you know, I mean, it doesn't take a lot to see that existentially things may feel a bit apocalyptic. Like, I mean, you know, um, in that sense, like, I mean, I think that, you know, people don't have the same confidence. So yeah, I, I think all those things contribute to anxiety. And then I think when you add on to that, things are just so much more real time. I mean, you know, um, I'll give you one example about something. I think I love the fact that I can WhatsApp with my friends, right? But it also creates a lot of anxiety. Like, I mean, 
I don't know how many of you who are watching this, but I mean, there was a time in which you didn't feel like you had to text back immediately people, right? So I think that also creates an anxiety, you know, a, a sense of just like, I have to always be connected. There's the fear of missing out. So I think when you take all that together, right? Existential dread, economic and social precarity, and a kind of technological environment that is about living completely in connection in real time, I think it, it, it massively increases anxiety. Did it help answer your question maybe? Yes. Um, um, good times. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, then I'd like to uh, move on and give the word to Bart. Uh, yes, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I also particularly enjoyed how, um, I don't know, you uh, kind of shine a light on the emancipatory power of media, if it accurately represents potential alternatives to corporate systems. Um, so my question is more about, um, do you think the framework of this research, which mostly focuses on media, um, can be applied to other forms of soft power? Mm. It's a really, really, really good question. Uh, absolutely. And in fact, I don't, media is not my main area of study. Um, but, uh, you know, you asked me to speak about it based on things and in, in, in like an arrogant white male, I just said, yes, of course, uh, I'm an expert. Uh, so I, I'm not a media, I'm not a media expert in that sense, right? Um, there's people who are much better I actually study other forms of soft power, which is like management discourses, political discourses, et cetera. Um, so for instance, absolutely. I mean, think about like the ways in which, I mean, think about this idea of the kinder, gentler manager at work, right? Or um, where it's like, you know, we're really here to help you, or I completely understand that you're overworked, et cetera, right? Um, so very much so. I think that you see that at all levels of soft power, okay? So I think the media is just one example. And I think it's all focused on trying to make us more resilient. Um, I think one way that, uh, you don't have to buy it, uh, you can shoplift it if you want. Um, but a book I wrote, uh, Ethics and Neoliberalism, was all about, um, said like how traditionally non-capitalist forms uh, 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 human relations, such as solidarity, become incorporated with the making us kind of more resilient capitalist subjects. So for instance, you know, um, if you're at work and you're all, you know, being told you have to do more with less, right? Like we don't have money. It's a very competitive time, right? So you all have to work more for less, right? Well, what happens? Like if someone has to work a shift at night, but they got to watch their kids, people cover for them, right? We do this all the time. It's one of the things that they don't talk about. Capitalism relies on us being collaborative and cooperative and caring about each other, right? How many times has like, you, I, mean, I take it from your uniform, so if I'm wrong, many of you are students, right? How many times have you helped a friend who's like, look, I've been so busy with things. I haven't done anything in this. Can you help me with my notes? Like three days before an essay is due, right? And of course you do it, even though it's like, you're like, well, you know, I was busy too, but you do it, right? And what happens with this is that, you know, this is a form of soft power because it perpetuates, right? Through our ethics, often non-market ethics, right? A system of overwork, a system of inequality, right? One of, one of the things, I'll give an example of soft power um, that isn't in media. So for my sins, um, I'm head of my uh, I'm a middle manager, essentially. I try to be a radical middle manager, but I'm head of my department, um, head of my group at my university. Um, and, you know, I, I find it interesting because uh, I, don't, I don't come from a management background, right? Like, even though I'm a professor of management, like, you know, I, I did my PhD in political economy and philosophy, right? I just happen to study oftentimes work capitalism, so... Um, I'm in a management department, but you would hear this discourse. Do you have it in, in the Netherlands of good citizenship? Okay. Now, when I when I became head of group, I'll tell you one thing. 
right? All I heard about was good citizenship. We need people to do things because they're good citizens. Now, you know who are not good citizens? And I don't mean this in a kind of like way, I mean, because of white cis males. If you ask, and, and, and this, is, I, this is from my experience now of almost 10 years in these roles, could you teach this extra class we, that this, this person can't do it? Can you do it? Yes. How much time do I get for it? Do I get paid more? Otherwise, no, right? Now, on the other hand, what I have found is that non-whites, uh, certainly non-males, and certainly non-cis males, they will often find that like they feel like they have to be good citizens. Oh, it's so horrible. Well, I guess I could teach that extra class if it would really help our group. Now that's a form of soft power, right? That's a form of using a discourse, which sounds very nice, right? We should be nice to each other. We should be good citizens to actually exploit us more. So one of the things that I, I've done, um, not because I'm a hero, but like, um, is gotten rid of good citizenship. I told people, nobody here is a good citizen. All of you are selling your labor. Like that's what this is about. All of you are selling your labor. Right? I don't care, like, what, like, if you're asked to do something, you get paid for it. Right? And oftentimes I feel weird because uh, I'm like the anarcho communist in the room that has to explain capitalist exchange to capitalists. I'm like, I come in, I sell you my labor, and you pay me money. Like, I'm not here because we're friends. I'm not here because I believe in, you know, this, like, you know, I mean, I do want to be collegial in these things, but. What I'm saying about this is this is a form of soft power, right? It's an everyday form of soft power. And it's a form of soft power that's also intersectional because certain people from certain backgrounds are taught and internalized from a young age that they don't have to abide by this, right? So the only way in which you stop this is through getting rid of this soft power discourse, right? And you say, none of us are good citizens. We're all capitalist subjects and I don't care you know, what color are you, what gender you are, whatever you do, if you're asked to do work, you get paid for it, right? <laughs> that's it. So I think that's, that's an I don't know if that helped answer your question, but that's something that's not in the media, but it's a clear form of soft power, right? And I would say that it's something that like, we should be much more sensitive to, much more aware, like how is, how are, us intensively really positive moral discourses such as, you know, being a good citizen used against us? And how are they used against us to also perpetuate existing inequalities? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I think that uh, we are at the end of our evening. Um, from the side of the board, I'd really like to thank you again. Um, we, I had a really good time. I think it's it's wonderful how you were able to portray such a really um, important and, and, and difficult topic in such a entertaining way. Oh, <laughs> um, I enjoyed this for sure. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. I hope it, I hope uh, it wasn't uh, too boring, and I hope uh, you got some insights out of it. And um, I think you have my email, so if people have follow up questions, uh, please feel free to email me. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much about that. All right. Uh, thank you all. I appreciate it. Uh, have a good one, everyone. Um, thank you very much. It's quite late, so you should probably get something. To, no, I'm saying <laughs> you should probably get something to eat as well. Uh, so have a good evening, okay? Thank you very good much. Evening. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Um, for the rest of you, I do have some announcements for the ones that are members of Sephroning.